questions. Okay, thanks for your patience. We are back uh, up and running. Um, undergraduates, you are now thinking this week about ideas uh, for final projects. As I mentioned, uh, I will take the first few minutes at the beginning of every class between now and the end of the semester to tell you some of the uh, interesting features of PyroSim, things that you may be able to use. Um, as you start to implement your final project, if things are wonky, let me know and we can talk about it uh, at the beginning of class. Um, in the final project document, uh, I just added a note here at the top, which is a link to the full documentation for PyroSim. Um, you're now probably familiar with about 90% of everything that's in there, but there's a remaining 10% uh, of things in, that, in the documentation that might be useful to you. I wanted to point out just uh, one useful one useful setting for some of you. Let's see here. <laughs> okay, we have some musical accompaniment today. All right, uh, let's see, where are we here? Okay, um, when you create your simulator, you've already seen that there are a number of arguments that you can send along when you create the simulator. The evaluation time, uh, play blind, play paused. There's an additional one which is DT, which is delta T, or the amount of time that passes from one time step to the next in seconds. So the default DT is 0.05, which is 0.05 seconds elapses in simulation from one time step uh, to the next. So some of you are thinking about having your robot run over uneven terrain or pick up an object, which means the collisions in your simulator are about to become more complex. You're going to have more bodies colliding in more different ways. And if you remember back to uh, the first few weeks of class when we were talking about physical simulation, uh, the most challenging computational aspect of a physics engine is detecting collisions between bodies and resolving them accurately. So if you have your robot uh, walking over uh, objects that you place on the ground and the robot is sinking into those objects or it goes to grasp an object and its pincers pass through the surface of the object, your collision model is not, uh, not working properly. The easiest way to fix that is to make your simulator more accurate. And the easiest way to do that is to reduce DT down from 0.05 to something less. Now what that less should be, I don't know. It depends on what you're, what you're doing. So you now have an additional knob to tune the, the accuracy of your simulator by turning down DT. But if you turn down DT without changing the number of time steps, what have you done to your simulator? It'll run the same <coughs> amount of time, real time. It'll run the, run the same count of run time, but since all of those are cut down run by changing DT, you have to increase this to compensate. You have, to t you have to increase the number of time steps to compensate. So as you're starting to play around with your simulator, remember there are now two uh, timelines running. There is real time reported by the clock right here in the real world. And there's the amount of time that elapses in the simulation. So how much time elapses in a simulation? It's 1,000 time steps time DT, the amount of time that elapses between any uh, two time steps, right? So 0 0.05 times 1,000, whatever that is. That's 50, 50 seconds of time elapses in the simulator. Now, depending on your computer and depending on whether you have the graphics turned on or off, that might take less than 50 times, uh, less than 50 seconds in real time or more than 50 seconds in real time. They're not necessarily the same. So if you have the DT without increasing the number of time steps, you have the number of, you have the amount of time that passes in the simulation, right? 25 seconds rather than, than 50 seconds. Is that something you have to keep in mind, like when your um, starfish robot crossed the reality gap? Is yes. You have to keep track of what real time is for that robot and what's in the simulator, or does they translate out? So, there's another parameter that you need to match to help cross the reality gap, right? How much time elapses from the starfish's point of view or the virtual robot and the physical robot? 
So from the robot's point of view, that matters because the sensors are firing at a certain rate in the physical robot. And in your virtual robot, the sensors report a new value every 0.025 seconds, right? So by changing DT, you're not just changing the accuracy of your simulation, you're also changing the refresh rate of the sensors and the motors. Make sense? Yes? Uh, what is the this default value for DT? D the default value is 0.05. So the work you've been doing now, it's, it's at 0.05. You can also speed up your simulation by increasing DT, but you'll start to see the inaccuracies, inaccuracies in the simulation creep in. Okay, question. Um, there is uh, an option here which is not built into your version of PyroSim, which is for uh, simulating uh, space robotics. So if you have something that's floating in zero G, it's not colliding with anything. Um, in those simpler situations, you may be able to get away with a less accurate simulator. Yeah. But for our purposes where we have robots moving over the surface of the Earth, you're probably not going to want to go above 0.05. So again, that's, we'll, we'll talk about other aspects of PyroSim, but that one's probably going to be useful as you prototype this week certain, certain ideas. Okay, any other questions about final project? Yes? Yeah, um, kind of related. Uh, I tried to do a population of 30 individuals just to see what would happen. 30 individuals at the same time in one simulator? Uh, no, or, no, no, okay. just um, in one population. Okay. Um, and it gives me an error because there's too many Python files open. Uh, that's possible. So um, PyroSim is using um, it's using sockets. So when you open when you start up uh, when you start up a PyroSim simulator, it's creating an instance of another executable on your computer, and they're communicating with one another. Depending on your machine, you may not be able to open thirty simulators in parallel. Right? Depends on your machine. So just do ten, evaluate those. Do the next ten, the next ten. Good question. Okay, anything else? Okay, back to uh, the schedule. Um, so we are working our way through uh, two different projects that came out of my group looking at ways to try and scale up evolutionary robotics, where we can have many more robots, many more fitness functions, many more people proposing fitness functions to robots. So how do we combine together lots of people and lots of evolutionary robotics instances to try and scale up the things that we've been talking about in this class uh, so far? We'll finish lecture uh, 21 now, which was an attempt to connect people with robots using language, where people propose fitness functions in the form of plain English, and how do we get robots to evolve against those fitness functions. And then we'll start in on the second project today, lecture 22, which is the DotBot project. And this was an attempt to get people not to teach robots through formulating fitness functions, but to actually help design the robots themselves. So in the last part of the class here, we're going to look at trying to evolve bodies and brains of robots together. This is particularly challenging. So as you'll see in a few minutes in the DotBot project, we had people designing the bodies of robots. And for each robot designed by a member of the crowd, an evolutionary algorithm would try and design controllers for that body plan. OK, come back to that in a minute. OK, so um, back to Twitch Plays Robotics. Okay, we ended last time by looking at some of the data that was generated by the crowd. And just to remind you, uh, we had these two robots. And for each robot, people could issue plain English. Let me just back up a little bit. People could uh, issue plain English, which would become a command. So for each of the two robots, the crowd issued a large number of commands. Each command was in effect for six minutes, or sorry, three minutes. And during that three minute period, six controllers, the Ns, were evaluated under that controller, which gives us N, I, J, K, which is the controller evaluated, is the Kth controller evaluated under the Jth command on the Ith robot, N, I, J, K. And for each one of those controllers, N, we had two additional numbers, which was the number of upvotes, or yeses, and the number of no votes, or no's that we got from the crowd, right? 
Okay, we took that huge data set, we filtered it out, we filtered um, uh, for all of the controllers that were evaluated under the command jump, and then we further filtered that for just those controllers that were evaluated under jump that received at least one yes or no vote. <coughs> Okay, we reran all of those controllers uh, on the simulated robot and generated this matrix T. So now for every controller, we also have a T, which is a matrix reporting all of the touch sensor information captured from the virtual robot. Okay, we then finally calculated O, which is a value that ranges between minus one and plus one. Minus one is unanimous negative reinforcement and plus one is unanimous positive reinforcement, right? So far so good? Okay, right? And we saw that there is some relationship between the sensor data or the felt experience of the robot, what it felt like when it performed some action and how the crowd responded to that action, right? It's not a perfect fit obviously, but generally speaking, the more time that the robot spent on the ground, the less, the more no votes the robot received. So we looked at this linear regression fit, this dashed line last time, which shows there was a negative slope for the worm robot, also a negative slope for the legged robot, but the actual slopes themselves are slightly different, which means that these two robots, because of their different morphologies, have grounded the symbols of language slightly differently. They both understand what jump means. Jump means the more time I spend on the ground, the more punishment I receive from the crowd. They both know that that's what jump means, but they understand it slightly differently. Right? Okay, that's where we ended last time. Okay, there was a question last time about our axis here, where we sort of came up with some transformation of the raw sensor data, right? We sort of have, we as humans, or as the investigators here, have an idea what jump means, so we kind of cheated a little bit, right? We combined touch, in a, touch information in a certain way that would, would increase the likelihood that the robots would be able to find a relationship. So the last step in this experiment was to try and train a second neural network now that would take in raw sensor data from the virtual robot and would output not an action or not a motor command, but a prediction. So as I mentioned before in the top left there, the Twitch Plays Robotics Project is made up of four phases. Phase one, the robots act, they do their things. Uh, second phase is the crowd is observing what the robots do and issue commands and reinforcement. Now we move into the learning uh, stage and finally the, uh, the learning stage where now the robots are going to try and learn to predict social response. Okay, so how does this work? <coughs> In the worm robot, as you can see there, the worm is made up of three objects. Each object has a touch sensor in it, so three touch sensors, which gives us a T matrix in the top right there, three columns, one for each of the touch sensors. Each row corresponds to one of the thousand time steps of the lifetime of one controller. So we now create the second neural network that has three input neurons. And this network is going to take the top row of one of these T matrices. We feed that in, the touch information received by a given controller at the first time step. Propagate that through the neural network like we've done many times before. Multiply, multiply the values of the input neurons by their corresponding weights. Take the raw sum at the output neuron, pass that through an activation function, and we picked an activation function that would squash the output value to a value between minus one and plus one. Okay, there's also a recurrent connection there, W, W3. We pushed in the first set of touch sensor values. We go to the second row. What were the touch sensor values at the next time step in this given controller's lifetime? Push that in, push that down to the output layer. The output neuron now combines the current sensory information with memory. What was the value of the output uh, neuron at the previous time step? 
Do the same thing again. Put in the third row of T, fourth row of T, <clears throat> fifth row of T, all the way through until we push in the thousandth final row of T to this network. And now we observe what is the value of the output neuron now. Might be hard to see in this image here, but we treat the value of the output neuron after that thousandth update as O prime, where O prime over on the right here is the predicted crowd response. So in essence, this robot sort of has two brains, one which is the traditional one that controls its action. The robot performs its action, it does its thing. And then the second neural network is watching the sensor data. It's sort of watching or feeling what the robot feels. And the output of that second neural network is making a prediction about how the crowd is going to respond. Right? So you're the robot. The crowd says J-U-M-P. You perform some action. And you make a prediction about how much positive and negative reinforcement you're going to get. That's the prediction part here, the fourth and final stage. So far, so good? OK. We're going to train these neural networks like we've done before. We're going to start with random weights. We're going to push, we're going to take one of these controllers. Remember, we have many of them that have been evaluated under jump and that have at least one yes or no vote. Push it through this second neural network. Take the difference between O prime, which is the network's prediction, and O, which is the actual response from the crowd. We have that information. Take the difference between those. Take that difference and set it aside for a moment. Take a sec our second controller, push it through uh, the second neural network here. Take the second difference, the second prediction, and the actual crowd response. Set that difference aside and push through every single controller that was evaluated on the worm robot under the command JUMP. We have a whole bunch of those differences. What is the fitness of this neural network? It's the sum of the differences. We're going to take the sum of all the differences. What was the difference between the network's prediction and actual crowd response? And what are we trying to do then with that sum of differences? We're going to try and minimize it, right? So we make a copy of that, of that neural network, introduce some mutation to the weights, do the whole thing all over again, and if the sum of differences of that new child neural network is lower than the sum of differences of the parent neural network, throw away the parent and keep the child. So far, so good? Okay, so if we do that for long enough, we should be able to obtain a neural network here which is good at predicting crowd response, right? We're going to minimize the sum of differences. The question is, how good is good? The way that we're going to do this is we're going to train this network not on every single controller evaluated on the worm under JUMP. We're going to take all of those controllers that we got from the worm, shuffle them, take half of them, use that for training, and the other half that we did not use during training, we use for testing. So we have our best neural network, the one that has the lowest sum of differences, and we're now going to give it the other half that this network never saw before and see how well it does at predicting social response for controllers that it has never seen before. So far, so good? Okay. So that's what is plotted here in green. So we have the simple or worm robot and the complex or legged robot. We did this hill climber many, many times. And on average, at the end, the neural network, when exposed to the testing data, that those controllers that had never seen before, its error was about 0.4. And it's about the same thing also for the legged robot. So what does 0.4 mean? Well, if we go back to the actual data here, if we had this actual point here, that neural network might have predicted for that given controller it might have predicted anywhere between plus 0.4 to minus 0.4. It was off by, on average, about 0.4. So not, uh, not great, but not bad. So it could more or less predict how the crowd was going to respond to a given, 
a given action. Okay, so point four again, what does point four mean? Well, we wanted to compare this against some controls. So one of the controls we did is shown in red here. This is the permuted control. Remember, we have all of these controllers that we got back from the worm bot and all of these controllers we got back from the legged robot. And for each one of those controllers, we have O, the fraction of pluses to uh, the, the fraction of positive to negative reinforcement signals. So we took all of those O's and we permuted them. We took an O from controller I and the, the O from controller J and swapped them and did that a whole bunch of times. So we had the same actual set of O's, but they were now no longer associated with the ends or controllers that gave rise to them. So we got the same sort of crowd response. And as you would imagine, when we do training and testing again, now those networks are not as good at predicting social response. They're significantly worse. Their, their error is higher than in the case of the actual experiment. So that shows that the, the green is actually able to, to predict what the crowd is doing. The second control experiment that we did here, random control, is we assumed that the crowd, uh, they were all trolls. All they ever did was give random pluses or random minuses. So we simulated people that were responding to that same set of controllers with just a yes or no at the flip of a coin, right? It was random, and as you would expect, can't do very well with that. So the fact that green did significantly better than red or blue actually tells us two things. First of all, it tells us that mostly people were providing honest signals. When the command was J-U-M-P and the robot did this, most people would say this. When the command was J-U-M-P and the robot did this, most people would do this. So we're getting mostly honest signals. If we weren't getting honest signals, green would be at the same height as blue. And the fact that people are giving honest signals, it can be learned by this evolutionary algorithm. We can train these robots to not only obey the command J-U-M-P, but when issued J-U-M-P, and they consider a new action, so the robot simulates an action itself, it's able to predict beforehand that people will approve or disapprove of that, that action. Okay, so that was exciting to us because at, this, the, at the moment in AI, unfortunately, most robots are sociopaths. They're not evil, they're sociopaths. They don't understand that this thing is much less important than that thing, right? That humans are somehow very important and that you have to choose what you do so that after the fact, the person would say you did the right thing or you didn't do the right thing. You might remember all the way back to the beginning of the course when we talked about perverse instantiation and there was that humanoid robot that was given the fitness function to go through the door open the door and go through it. What did that robot do? It opened that wooden door and then literally went through the door and demolished it. Did I show that video? That's a shame, okay. I don't know if I have it here, I will show you next time. Perfect example of perverse instantiation. The robot did exactly what the investigators wanted it to do. It opened the door and went through it. But you can imagine after the robot opened the door and demolished the door by literally going through the door, the investigator said, that was not what I meant, right? Okay, so our simple robots here minimize perverse instantiation because they can predict beforehand. I was told to do this, I'm thinking about doing this, and because I have a sense of people, I'm able to predict social response I know whether they're going to approve or disapprove of my action. So our simple worm robot and legged robot here are slightly less sociopathic than most state-of-the-art machines that are out there at the moment. Okay. So let's, again, just try and build up an intuition for this. Here's the worm robot again. Here are all the actions that it's performed uh, so far. Let's imagine that we deploy the worm robot out into the world and a human points at the worm and says, J-U-M-P. The worm comes up with a new action, and it's the physical worm robot uses its simulation of self. 
Remember the evil starfish that had a simulator running of self? The physical worm robot starts up simulation of self and says, OK, I was asked to JUMP. It simulates a candidate action, and that candidate action spends 51% of the time on the ground. Right? It's going to be hard in this case for the worm to predict how the crowd is going to respond because there were some other actions it performed very close by horizontally. So there were other actions that spent about the same amount of time on the ground that received unanimous negative reinforcement and unanimous positive reinforcement for other actions that were also very similar. So at this particular point, uh, at this, for this particular action, even armed with this social prediction ability, the machine is going to say, people are, seem not to be so sure about this particular action. So that action is probably unsafe. I'm not sure about how people are going to feel about that action. So maybe the physical, uh, the physical worm sets that action aside, comes up with another one out here, and says, OK, this one I'm sure about. I'm pretty sure that, with one exception, an action out here, most people are going to disapprove of that action. So that's probably not a good idea. So the physical robot, uh, physical robot keeps thinking, comes up with an action out here, perhaps, and says, OK, most of the time for this action or similar actions to the one I'm currently considering, most people gave a thumbs up. So I'm sure that people are going to approve of that action. Right? Thumbs up on both accounts. That's the action that the physical worm robot carries out. OK, so that's the connection between language, action, and now morality. OK. Just to come back to this, as, as you've seen in the Twitch Plays Robotics project, this is very simple. We're dealing with very simple motoric words like jump. Remember, we played the embodied metaphor game uh, last class. What we're working on now is how far up the ladder can we push this approach from very simple language to increasingly abstract language. That's ongoing at the moment. OK, I just wanted to touch uh, on this book here. It got a lot of attention a few years back. It's written by a philosopher. Um, most of this book is, is what would happen if we're able to build machines that are not just intelligent, but super intelligent, more than uh, human intelligence. I don't know how I feel about that. However, there is a significant part of this book that is dedicated to perverse instantiation and how to resist, uh, how to resist perverse instantiation. It's a concept introduced in this book called coherent extrapolated volition. This was actually not an idea of the author, but um, one of his colleagues, Yudkowsky. Um, basically, what coherent extrapolated vo volition is, is a general method to combat perverse instantiation. What does it mean? It means a friendly AI, so one that is not sociopathic, one that's able to understand people and be able to predict their response to actions. A friendly AI should be able to implement policies, so policy is just another word for an action or a controller, that despite human differences, so on Twitch Plays Robotics, we might have had multiple people that were voting at the same time. And some people may vote differently. One person may consider that action a jump, while another person may not consider it a jump. So obviously, people differ. And if we're basing this on a voting system, not everyone's going to vote the same. So despite our differences, we hope they cohere, generally speaking. And the machine is able to come up with something that find an action that, despite people's differences, that action, at least, everyone can agree, that is definitely jump. Right? That our future selves, so not the self that's here now, but the self in the future that's going to look back on the action carried out by the robot and say, yes, robot, you did the right thing or the wrong thing. Right? We could have a machine that receives commands from us and says, OK, I know you want me to do J-U-M-P. I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? I'm thinking about doing that. What do you think? We can't answer every single question. We want to try and have a machine that has a good enough model of us that knows in the future we'll look back on what it did and say, good job or not a good job. OK. And that we would be likely in the future to approve of those, of those policies, vol volition. 
Okay, so I just wanted to point that out for those of you that are interested in the ethics of AI and the philosophy of intelligence. This is an interesting read. You can take the superintelligence part with a grain of salt, but it has an interesting discussion about how would we actually create a friendly AI. So Twitch Plays Robotics, which I just showed you, is one attempt to implement these abstract <clears throat> ideas. Okay. All right, I think we'll leave that there for today. Any questions about Twitch Plays Robotics? Okay, onward. Okay, so we just looked at one way of combining computers and evolutionary algorithms and robots and people to try and create uh, intelligent AI and friendly AI. Now we're gonna switch to the DotBot project. We're gonna look at trying to broaden the design of robots. So we're gonna try and design bodies and brains together rather than fix the body plan like the worm bot and the legged robot that you just saw. How do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to have people do the design of bodies and then let evolutionary algorithms design controllers. The design of bodies seems a little bit more intuitive than designing controllers. So let's let people do that part and have machines do that part. And later we'll come back to looking at evolutionary algorithms that do both. Okay, so again, the DotBot project was also a crowdsourcing project that we tried to do out over the web. Uh, you can try this out later. There's the URL. It's now embedded in the video lecture, so you can go and uh, check out the URL and try this yourself. This is the DotBots pro DotBot project. So on the website here, it says, try to design a robot that moves further. Um, and we tried to rely on the metaphor of connect the dots, thus the DotBot project. So I click on a dot and drag to some other dot, click on a dot, drag to another dot. Okay, here's my robot. Once I've designed my robot, I click go. And this is a uh, slightly different simulator, which is all in browser, kind of nice. How's our robot doing? Not so well. Okay. So you'll notice that we've taken this abstract dot drawing on the right and instantiated it as a, as a virtual robot in a physics engine. As it's moving, uh, you can see the time here is counting down, and then the fitness is simply how far does the center of the robot move from the origin. Okay. We've had thousands of people use this so far, and they've designed thousands of robots. I don't know if anybody has actually designed that exact robot before. I had a student sit down and actually enumerate all the possible robots that are possible in this design, and I forget that number, but it's a big number. Okay, let's assume that no one has ever created this robot before. So this morphology gets added to a database of, of all morphologies, and if it's new, the machine also, the server creates a new hill climber for just that robot. So if we have K morphologies in the database, we have K hill climbers, one dedicated to each morphology. And the first time this robot was made, as you just saw, the hill climber is going to create a random controller for it. When I click go again, what do you think the hill climber is doing now? So I, as the human, created a morphology. When I did, it ended up creating a hill climber. That hill climber created a random controller for this robot, which you saw in the first simulation. I click go. Now the robot should be behaving a little bit differently. Looks like we're going to get lucky here. This particular controller traveled a little bit further. What was the hill climber doing behind the scenes during these two simulations? Exactly, right? So the parent was the initial random controller, and the child was some randomly modified copy of the, the parent. So in this case here, the child just did better than the parent, so the random parent controller is going to die out, and the child becomes the parent. That's interesting, because I felt like when I did that, um, the first time I did it, it worked really well, and then after that, it didn't seem like it was taking that one. Oh, on this one? Yeah. Okay, so let's see what happens, right? So now we have that child. That child produces a randomly modified copy of itself. We'll call that the grandchild. 
Remember, this is a mutant of the, of the parent, so it doesn't always do better, right? Okay, so this grandchild, it looks to me, is going to do worse than the child. So what happens to the grandchild? It's gone, and, we, and the hill climber, hill climber goes back to the child, and if I click go a fourth time, that child will produce a second grandchild, right? That's the hill climber. Yes? Um, so are these controllers stored locally? Like, so when you created that on your machine, that's the first time that controller's been evaluated, or is it stored online so that every single time that machine's been made, we're still hill climbing? That's a good question. So the answer is this is all stored centrally back at the web, at the server. So the simulation of the robot is done locally on the client, but all of this information is going back to the server in, in our lab. And now in this database, there's this robot with the child controller in there, which is about to produce a second grandchild. So you're saying that, okay. like, so it's sort of behind the scenes, it's saving it, but you're not going to see it. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. good, good question. I will show you shor shortly, but I'm going to keep you in suspense for a few minutes. Okay, so all of this is happening back on the server. So I know this is a device-free zone, so you can't try this out now. But if you were to go and draw this exact robot and click go on your machine, it will not create a random hill climber. It'll simulate the second grandchild, the one that's waiting in the database to be evaluated. If I click go, it'll be done on my machine. If you click go, it'll be done on your machine. Um, will it create a mutant the first time, or will we see the actual uh, the parent that uh, would have evaluated? You'll see the second grandchild. So from, from the DotBot project's point of view, doesn't matter what machine it's being run on, there's one hill climber, parent child, parent child, parent child, that is running in time. And some of them are being evaluated on one computer and others are being evaluated on another computer. Doesn't matter. How does it deal with, like, I guess, chirality? So if you, if the connectivity is the same but it's oriented differently in space, does yep. it continue to use that same controller or is it treated as a different robot? That's a good question. <laughs> so the system is chirality agnostic and symmetry agnostic and position agnostic. So. As you say, if I were to take this robot and draw the mirror image of it, left to right, or top to bottom, the machine would treat that as a new, a new machine. It doesn't know that one is a rotation or a translation of the, of the other. We could have built that in. We ran out of time, didn't have time. Okay. So everything you draw, unless it's identical to this, is a different robot. So far, so good? Okay, so you get the basic idea for DotBot now, right? So like Twitch Plays Robotics, we have multiple robots, multiple people, and multiple computers. And what we're going to look at in this lecture is what is the right way to combine all these things together so that in the end, we get a robot that travels as far from the origin as possible. There's different, if you think this through, there's different ways we can do this. And I'm going to show you now three different ways we can, you can do this. And we'll see which of those three does the best. OK, so here's a visualization of what I just showed you. OK, so in panel A, we have user one, which in this case was me. User one draws the design. So gray, remember that gray means that the uh, person is, dr is drawing the morphology. And then in B, the user one's computer, computer one, uh, simulates the first random controller generated by this brand new hill climber. And I'm visualizing this controller with red and blue bands here, and we'll come back to that in a moment. In C, I've pressed go a second time on my computer, and this is the child controller of the parent. And in this little visualization here, the child traveled further than the parent controller. Child kills off the parent. And on and on we go. User 387 happened to draw exactly the same robot and click go on their computer. So computer 387 simulated the kth iteration of the hill climber and pushed this design a little bit further. So far, so good? OK, I'm going to come back to this slide in a moment, but I'm going to jump ahead a few slides <coughs> to show you what the controller looks like on this robot. It is not a neural network controller. It's a little bit different. Okay. 
What does this controller look like? The controller for any one of these robots is just one long bit string. We try to keep things simple. How does this work? Well, as you saw in the simulator, when you connect together dots with lines, the dots become cubes and the lines become cylinders that attach neighboring cubes together, right? Cube, cylinder, cube, cylinder, cube. At every cube cylinder intersection here, we add a rotational joint. So there's one, two, three, four joints in this cartoon robot here, and one, two, three, four, five objects. So that's how we take the drawing and convert it into uh, a pyrosim robot. Okay. So what does the uh, what does the controller look like? Well, the controller is made up of these triplets here. And the middle digit in each triplet is 1 if a bar exists and 0 if a bar does not exist. It's grayed out here to show that the hill climber has no control over the middle bit in these triplets because that was set by the user, right? They are drawing the bars. So the hill climber cannot play around with the middle, the middle uh, bit. Okay. The bit that's to the left of the middle bit and the bit that's to the right of the middle bit are two bits which control the two hinge joints, right? So for every bar, for every line I drew, without me knowing it, I was creating two rotational joints, right? Okay. So, um, and then each one of these joints is not controlled by a motor neuron from a neural network. We're going to send in a CPG. What do CPGs do? They emit a sinusoidal pattern, right? So if you go back and play around with DotBot, if you watch the cubes, you'll see that they rock back and forth at a fixed frequency. That's the CPG. Okay, so what does the zero or the one mean? Zero means there's zero phase offset. It draws a sinusoidal pattern. And a one represents that there is a one offset. It draws the cosine curve. <clears throat> Same frequency, both of them go at the same frequency, but they can go at different phase offsets. So if we had, for example, zero, zero, then the two joints at, on either end of the bar are gonna rotate back and forth by following the sine curve. If they both receive one, one, they're both gonna rock back and forth with the cosine curve. If it's zero, one, then one is doing sine and one is doing cos, and if it's one, zero, one is doing cos, and one is doing sine. They move in <laughs> antiphase. Make sense? So there are no sensors here. The robot is completely blind. We're basic, the hill climber is basically setting the movement strategy of the robot. Everything is controlled with CPGs. So this robot has five objects, four rotational joints, and four CPGs, and the phase offsets of those four CPGs are set by the hill climber. That's the controller. Okay, so that's what the that's what the red and that's what the red and blue here is supposed to simulate. It's supposed to represent red is sine, blue is is cosine. Okay, so while user one is playing around with his robot, user two creates the robot you see in panel E. This could be in parallel. It could be a day later. It could be a day earlier. It doesn't matter. When user two uh, hits go on her machine, computer two, her robot gets this separate hill climber, which creates this random controller you see in F. She, uh, user four hits go on their computer, they happen to create the same uh, robot, and user 1142 gets this robot to move quite a bit further. <clears throat> Meanwhile, user one gets frustrated with their design and see some of the designs that are arriving on the website. So one detail I haven't mentioned yet is that users are able to see some of the other designs that are being created by the crowd. So user one sees the design created by user two and sees user four and then user 1142 build on that and sees the progression of this hill climber, sees this robot doing better and better and better, User one discards their design and creates not a clone of user two's design, but a bigger one. Because user one has figured out that the game is just to get the robot to move as far from the origin as possible. 
So all things being equal, better to make a big robot. Okay, so there is collaboration in two different ways. I can, I can, I can donate computational effort to somebody else's design. That's collaboration model one. Or, or I can see someone else's design and make a variant of that design and improve on things that way. Okay. So the one on the right, even though it looks like a scale up version of a new body. Exactly. It is also scale agnostic. So from the system's point of view, robot E and robot I are completely different. Different hill climbers. Isn't that because the I has like an extra joint in the middle? I think I remember doing that when it was it, yeah. yeah, and it's also not quite the same thing mechanically, right? It's got more degrees of freedom. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so that's one model. Here's another model. Okay, in this model, everything is exactly the same as the one you just saw, except people can't see each other's designs. You play the dot bot on the website, but there are no other designs that you see on the website. And I forget which version is currently running. Ah, okay, the wor version that's running right now, this is the one I'm about to describe. As I design my robots here, you don't see any other robots on the site. Model number one, where people could see each other's designs, there's a, uh, a high scoreboard, if you like, at the top here of the 10 best designs so far. Okay. So in model two here, we have user one, they make their own uh, morphology and they evolve it for a little while then they get tired of their own design they come up with a second design they do that for a while they make a third design and in parallel while they're doing that user 2 is doing her thing user n is doing his thing and so on and so forth right there the people are independent right and off we go but if user 5 came along and drew another plus it would still count towards the plus if you, by chance, draw a robot that someone else has already drawn, then you contribute to their... Hasn't that hasn't changed. It could happen, but the probability of that happening maybe is lower. Well, it depends on what shape you're looking at. I think the plus is probably pretty common. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. That's model number two. Model number three is we take the genome from the hill climber, we take this and we, we ungray out the gray boxes. So now the hill climber can flip the bits in the middle of the triplets and in essence it can add and remove parts. It can also add triplets to the end of this genome and can build larger, smaller robots. So in essence, using the same hill climber and the same genetic encoding, so our genome here is a bit string and the phenotype is our dot bot. We can have the hill climber design both the body and the controller of the robot together. Jeremy. I forget, is, yep. does it constrain connectedness? Or can you just work with the You can have disconnected okay. pieces. You can make a dot bot swarm. You can make little <coughs> robots inside this, this grid if you want. If the robot changes its own morphology, um, does that jump it to another set of controls that have already been involved for that new morphology? That's a good question. Um, how did we do this? No, they're all independent hill climbers. I think we made like a, a thousand hill climbers. They each start with random bodies and brains, and then each of them mutates, and they may mutate the body and the brain, but they just, they just keep going. So we've sprinkled a thousand dots on the landscape of all possible dot bots, and those thousand dots, like the parallel hill climber, actually this is the parallel hill climber, those thousand dots climb their local hills in the fitness landscape of dot bot land. Okay? All right. So we have model one, people collaborating together, observing each other's designs, and contributing computational effort to the designs they think is best because the game is get the robot to travel as far as possible, not get your robot to travel as far as possible, get any robot to travel as far as possible. Then we have people working in silos independently. They can't see each other's designs. They just do their own thing. 
And then we have the purely machine team, no humans allowed. Which team does better? Three different teams here. The third team is, sorry, is this team. So we've just got a thousand computers or a thousand hill climbers. That's what the little computer here is supposed to represent. And each hill climber is designing body and brain together, right? So we have evolutionary time or iterations of the hill climber along the horizontal axis here. And mutations can make changes to body and brain as, as it goes. I think my vote would be for group three. I guess okay. because if you can change the control of your morphology and you have all the computing power to do all the things, it's kind of doing what group one is doing, but it's just automated. It's automated, right? Surely this is going to do better. I don't know, but I, I, I guess I would guess group one, and it's kind of a guess, but just people have some intuition about how things move, and you see how this one does, I guess that all that didn't move very well because it's too big, it's got too many degrees of freedom and it doesn't really get anywhere. Yep. So I'm gonna try something that's a little bit simpler. Right. right. That didn't really seem to be part of group three so much. Okay, so I'm gonna pull out one thing from your observation which is people have an intuition about how these things might move, right? Okay, so that is actually the hypothesis here, right? So if team one wins, that means people do have some intuition, right? This is a very, very, this is a massively large fitness landscape, right? A large search space. There's basically an infinite number of dot bots. Not quite infinite, but might as well be, right? So if people have an intuition, they should intuitively be moving their hill climber to some part of this vast fitness landscape where there are mountains and not just hills. Right? That's the hypothesis, whether they can do it. If they don't have an intuition, they're going to do no better than a purely automated machine that can just crank through these designs as quickly as possible, and with a thousand scouts moving up the slopes of various hills in the fitness landscape, the machines will find a faster locomoting robot than, than the humans. Right? Most people don't vote for team number two, because if people do have an intuition, they should be sharing it. It's hard to justify why team number two would do well. There is an argument you can make for why team two might do better than team one. What might that be? Maybe the first people, the ones that are on the leaderboard, are all terrible. And you're like, oh, now you're like following the crowd. Whereas it's like, if you were alone, you might be able to come up with the optimal solution without being influenced by the people. Exactly, right? You can talk about the wisdom of the crowd or the madness of the crowd, right? Group think. So you actually see this. If you go back and look at the logs of people playing the DotBot project, they will also often hit on something like what you see in E there, and then people will make lots of variants of it, never realizing that there is something that's actually much better than the four-legged robot that you, that you see here. They, People can get trapped in local optima as well, right? Oh, look at, look at robot E, it's doing pretty well, so I'm gonna make variants of E, or I'm gonna dedicate more of my computation to hill climber E, and, and off you go. Okay, kept you in suspense long enough? Okay. Green is the independent team, and we ran this for, uh, 20, what is that, 2,700 updates of, uh, 2,700 updates of hill climbers combined. And at that point, um, we switch, and blue is the people and machines working together, team number one, and red is the purely machine team. We stopped the green team earlier um, because it wasn't doing as well and we only had a limited amount of time to do this experiment. So we switched things over and everyone who arrived at the DotBot project would be, would be put in team one. <coughs> Sorry, I forgot to mention one other detail. How did people end up in team one or team two? When we first deployed this experiment and you came to the DotBot project, you would see either this page 
where you'd see designs at the top. And for each of those designs, you can see the fitness of the best controller for that design so far. If you, a second person came to the website, they would see exactly the same thing, but A would be blanked out, like you saw when I played the DotBot project here. So in essence, when a new user arrives at the site, the server flips a coin, heads you, you go into team one, tails you go into team two. So if someone reset the cookies on their browser... Then we flip the coin again, but if they do not reset their cookies, we remember who they are, and if they come back, they go into their team. Good question. Okay. So we were flipping the coin back and forth uh, up until this point, and then we said, okay, it's pretty clear which of the blue and the green teams is doing well, so we'll switch off the green team. All humans go into team uh, one, and the machines kept doing their thing and did extremely poorly. Okay. Yes? What, uh, you refresh me on the machine algorithm. It was just a thousand random robots. A, a thousand hill climbers, right? Random controllers. And then they update <coughs> their, their design through mutation. A mutation might change the morphology or the controller. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. I'm sorry, it's not a thousand, it's less than a thousand, because if it was a thousand hill climbers and they were getting out to 1250 there, that would only be 12.5 updates of each of the hill climbers. And I remember it was definitely many more iterations than that. It wasn't a thousand, it was less than that. I forget the details, we can go and look in the, the paper. Anyway, it was hard for us to get the machines to do this. So one takeaway from this that I want you to just set aside and we'll come back to in two weeks time. It's extremely difficult to get an evolutionary algorithm to design morphology and control together. It's tricky. The main reason why, and you can almost see it from this picture here, imagine that, uh, imagine that computer C here has this particular morphology and it's updated the controller for this morphology a couple times, so there's been three or four mutations that have changed the controller for this morphology, but not the morphology, and it's traveling faster and faster and faster, and then a mutation adds or removes a line to this design. How well is that child going to do? It's likely very poorly because the controller assumes that it has three legs, not two. Yes, if I surgically graft a third leg onto you and ask you to walk out of the classroom, I'm going to have a pretty hard time doing so, right? It's very hard to get a machine to, design, to optimize morphology and control simultaneously, and we'll come back to that in a couple weeks. Or tie your leg to someone else's. And tell you or tie your, your leg to someone else's. Lots of ways you can morphologically change a human being and make things difficult. True. Okay. Okay, so... What exactly were these three teams doing? These are the top five designs from the collaborative and machine team. The humans are collaborating, looking at each other's designs, and the machines or the hill climbers are doing the controllers, so that's CMT, team one. Team two, humans are acting independently, but the machines or the hill climbers are still updating the controllers. That's the independent machine team, and here's the pure machine team. Why did humans do better than machines? They're just so much more simple. Like, if you look at the machine ones, they have so many different legs or parts connected. It would be very unlikely for that to sort of work out. Exactly. So thinking about thinking is misleading, and in this case it was us, the experimenters, that fell into that trap. We weren't quite sure if humans had intuitions about how to design good dot bots. Once we started to see the designs that the machines were producing, we said, absolutely, we do, right? We may not be great. There may be other designs out there that are better than what the CMT team found, but certainly we have an intuition about what makes, what, what makes for a good body for an optimizer to produce a controller for it. Those three Ts, are they all the same? They're size. all different. Remember that. Well, no, no, no. I, I, oh. I know that they all have different controllers. Are they the same size? But are they the same morphology if you've if you considered the rotation? They the are. The same number. Okay. They are. Yes. 
Okay. So we see, you can clearly see that the human designs are simpler. What exactly do we mean by simple? Is that the only thing? You have less connections and less. Uh, Let, less connections, yep. Yeah. And the machine ones have like a lot of squares. A lot of squares, okay. So there's definitely fewer pieces in the human designs. When the, the machine is being gener generating its uh, designs, yeah. was it just flipping a coin whether a bar was on or off? Because it looked like about 50% filled. It is. Uh, uh, yes, at the beginning it's 50 50, okay. but evolution obviously could reduce or add. Didn't make much progress on that. Um, the human designs have, uh, all of them have some sort of symmetry. Pretty much, I think every single one of the human designs, you can find a line where you cut it in half and flip it over, it'll match the other side. We did not say anything to people about symmetry. Why did humans tend to not only create simpler machines, but symmetric machines? Right? We have intuition about things that move about in the real world because you are one and you observe them all the time. So implicitly, people seem to be applying their intuition about uh, biomechanically sound designs. Right? If you're not bilaterally symmetric and you're trying to move over flat ground, it's harder. Right? Okay, what else? Human designs are simpler. They're also uh, more symmetric. Are there any other features of these sets that distinguish them? The human designs are all the top <clears throat> three quarters of the this plane, whereas the machine ones are kind of at the bottom. OK, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that may or may not matter. Close loops. Close loops in the, human, in the machine designs, right? People didn't tend to do that. So um, I thought that closed loops were bad. It would be hard to see how a closed loop would help you. I showed this to some middle schoolers uh, a few summers back, mm -hmm. and a seventh grader created a large loop, and it did just as well as these designs in the top, which we hadn't seen for quite a, quite a while. So she placed a new design on the, on the leaderboard here. So it's not just, so loops can be helpful. A lot of the human ones are similar, if not the same, just like something different, like either orientation or placement in the square. That's right. So humans tend to be converging, converging to the same sort of region in the, the search space. I also wonder if the, uh, if the fitness landscape for the machine designs is much more rugged. Like, you know, if one of those might do better if you were able to search every possible controller and find the absolute optimal one. All three teams are searching exactly the same fitness landscape. They're just searching it in different ways. Well, no, but the controller, if, if you look at, if you take the controller out of it, or if you take the, the, the morphology out of it, finding a yep. controller that's going to do well with something that has a lot more objects is a lot harder. That's true. So it, they happen to be in a different part of the search space, which is the big dot box, but it's still the same total space, right? Right. But the, the, okay. The, the, hold the, hold the, on to that. We're falling a little bit behind. It's a good sure. good discussion point. Point for now is they are all searching the same space, but they're clearly searching it in different ways. We uh, used some state-of-the-art robot technology, and we built the T-Bot here, which everyone really liked. This is the Lego Mindstorms kit here. So with a little bit of effort, we could get one of these machines to cross the reality gap. We won't go into details about that. Um, here's uh, the top 10. Uh, here's some more of the top, top designs. So one of the things we notice is it's not just symmetry, but people tended to make robots that were made up of just one component, so all of the all of the dots were connected, right? So again, you can create designs that have, for example, two components. So here are two robots here. But the vast majority of designs created by people were very symmetric. Over here had high symmetry and had one or maybe two components. The dark uh, squares here represent particular dot bots that did well, and light gray are particular dot bots that did poorly.
Okay, so can't, we're now that's crowdsourcing of robotics. We sourced from the crowd lots of designs and got hill climbers to design them. Next stage in the experiment, and we've got five minutes left, I'll just introduce this idea, was to go from crowdsourcing to crowd seeding. Now, what, what's crowd seeding? We're going to take ideas from the crowd, extract those ideas, and seed a purely machine team. Okay, so symmetry is good, and number of components is good. So imagine now I take this observation of these features and I boil this down to a fitness function, which looks like this. Okay, so any design, we can assign a fitness to the design. This has nothing to do with locomotion at the moment. This fitness is just how symmetric and how few components does your design have. So if you have a maximally symmetric design, you have an S of one, and if it's just one component, or so it can have zero components, so actually that's fine, this would be the maximum score that you get, right? Maximum symmetry and minimum number of components. We're gonna change that and call that F1, and we're gonna create a second fitness function, which is the same as always, displacement from the origin. Now, we're going to restart team number three, the, team, the machine team, and every design is going to be evaluated for F1 and F2. We're going to discard the hill climber that we used in, machine t, uh, in team three and replace the hill climber with another evolutionary algorithm that's able to handle the optimization of two fitness functions. What is that evolutionary algorithm? We saw it a few weeks ago. We saw an evolutionary algorithm that's able to optimize both fitness components at the same time. The multi-objective optimization. Multi-objective optimization or MOO, right? So if you remember multi-objective optimization, we put F1 here and we put F2 here, and every controller or every dot bot now becomes a point in this plane. And we're looking for robots that not only optimize F2, that travel quickly, but that also adhere to the, design, to the designs we found from humans. So designs that have high F1 are symmetric and have low component counts. And if they are high in F1 and in F2, they're symmetric, have low component counts, and they move quickly. So far, so good. So team one, or team three, was just machines optimizing F1, and team four now uh, is just machines that are optimizing F1 and F2. What do you mean that team, it was optimizing F2 because? I'm oh, sorry, just F2, right? So team three, which now becomes the control algorithm, the one that we're comparing against, is the original team three that's just optimizing F2, just optimizing displacement. That's how well it did. And team four, which is still purely machines, they're doing better after we seed them with ideas that we've extracted from the, the crowd. Make sense? So I, I walked you through part one, which is crowdsourcing. I walked you through part two, which is, which is crowd seeding. There's a part three, which is we as the investigators went in and looked carefully at all the designs that the humans had produced, and the best we could do was to pull out two features. Turns out that there are many other things that the crowd was doing other than creating symmetric and connected designs. So in part three, which we'll see next Tuesday, I'm going to show you how we used machines to extract more features from the crowd and use that to reinvigorate the purely machine team. Okay, you have a quiz due tonight. Um, let me know if you have questions about final project ideas, and I will see you all on Tuesday. Thank you very much.